Hello and welcome to Brooks TV, I'm Ed Templer. And I'm Eric Garay, coming up in this week's episode. Jing Zhang finds out more about an exciting program for art teachers. We found out more about an exciting organization for young transplant survivors. And with a modern monorail service, one of the proposed options for the county council, Ben Davis looks into how it could all look. The Oxford Sexual Abuse and Rape Crisis Centre received a £16,000 donation. Our reporter, Elka Teichman, found out the story. On March 22nd, a woman posted a no-makeup selfie of her battered face after a man allegedly attacked her at an Oxford nightclub. The attack led her to raise money for the Oxford Sexual Abuse and Rape Crisis Centre. Within four days, she raised £12,000. Many articles covered the selfie, but the bigger issue of sexual violence was largely left untouched. The UK reports the joint fifth highest incidence of physical and sexual violence in the EU. What we do know is that sexual violence is a very hidden uh, subject for many. We also know that many um, survivors of sexual violence will never tell anyone about it. Some of the um, research suggests that up to 40% of women survivors of sexual violence will never disclose that to anybody. Um, we also know that only 15% of women will ever report an experience of sexual assault or violence to the police. Oxford is in the top 25% of safest cities in the UK, but the conviction rate in Oxford Crown Court is a six-year low, with only 24% of trials resulting in conviction in 2013. Helen Drakett, Deputy Chief Crown Prosecutor said. One reason the conviction rate has fallen across the country is because the CPS is now prosecuting cases that may have been dropped in the past. Because of concerns, juries could be affected by the myths or stereotypes surrounding rape and sex cases. It's worrying that that's, that, that that's the case, um, particularly because it sends a message to people who've experienced sexual violence, which doesn't necessarily engender confidence in the system. In addition to providing free, confidential support to 350 survivors each year, the centre trains police officers on the impact of sexual violence. Today, they are training professionals who may interact with survivors during their daily jobs. Within OSARC, we, we, we kind of define it very broadly and, um, and we think of sexual violence as any kind of act of a sexual nature where consent isn't given. The programme aims to raise awareness of the effects of sexual violence. It also provides advice on how to react to a disclosure of assault. Jeannie has raised more than 16,000% of her original £100 target. At the moment, we know that a huge need in Oxfordshire is um, for one-to-one -one specialist face-to-face -face counselling. Um, and so some of the funding will enable us to boost that project. Um, and launch something that we hope will have a huge impact on, on the lives of women in Oxfordshire. Unfortunately, sexual violence is still all too common. If more people report cases of sexual assault, there is a greater chance of increasing the public's awareness and reducing this kind of behaviour in the future. This is Elka Teichman reporting for Brooks TV News. If you're seeking help for yourself or a friend, you can email their helpline at support at osark.org.uk. Our reporter Neil Hewson explains the sticky cause of roadworks and traffic chaos in Oxford recently. A sewer collapses near the centre of Oxford, creating major delays and frustration. But how did it happen? Because of something called a fat bird. Fat and cooking oil put down the drain cools sticks to the walls of the sewer and goes hard. More fat comes along and sticks to that. Items like wet wipes that are flushed away also stick to the fat, increasing the problem. Eventually, the sewer may become blocked or, as happened here in Oxford, may collapse under the weight. Thames Water clears around 55,000 blockages each year at a cost of 12 million pounds and 7,000 customers suffer from sewer flooding in their homes and gardens. 
something to think about the next time you're cooking with lard. The inevitable consequence, of course, is major roadworks. And what is the impact? Um, I think it's causing problems, uh, major, major problems, because you have about five, six different entries and exits out of this area, and everyone's controlled by a single traffic light. So it's causing, it's causing tailbacks in all directions. Um, people just can't move anywhere. And for us, obviously, our livelihood is trying to get to the station or the Gloucester Green area, and we just can't move anywhere. And people are having to stay away, to be honest, and not working. This is Neil Hewson reporting for Brooks TV News. Now, having a transplant is a life-changing event, and there are many groups out there dedicated to helping young people who have gone through this experience. Our reporter, Saran Lee, investigated one of these wonderful groups helping teens bond with each other who have experienced similar things that they have. On 26 of April 2014, a unique group of people gathered together at Oxford Brooks Sports Centre. You wouldn't believe they have had a kidney transplant from the energy level shown and the smiles on their faces as they participated in various physical activities. We interviewed two young adults and the organiser to share their experiences. Luckily it was sort of controlled with uh, medication, so it was steady for about two and a half years. And then after that, I end up uh, having a kidney transplant in December 2010. I was in hospital for five days, fully recovered, and never looked back since. But I still wanted to thank them for giving me the gift of uh, life, really, because otherwise I would have been on dialysis thereafter and waiting for a long time for a new kidney. My mum gave me this kidney. She, uh, I was going to go back on the list and I was quite sad at all the odds they showed me about a non-live donor and so my mum was, oh I'll try and I was like, oh, quite nervous because it is my mum. And I was more nervous when I had the operation at how my mum was doing because she had to go in first and so when I knew she was okay it was alright. Sadly, um, three people a day uh, die through the lack of um, available organs. Uh, and this is just one event where we can show just the positive benefits of organ transplantation. And if anybody wants to consider organ donation, just get your name down on the register. It's NHSBT. Uh, if you Google for organ donation, it'll come up. It's a very straightforward application to make. All of these young people that are here today, uh, all these brave souls, that are, most of whom have been through a very long illness before um, getting the transplants, um, are all fighting fit now and um, striving to, to live the life that they've been generously given by the donors. During the break, Dr. Paul Harden shared his opinions and concerns about the young adults. When you're a young person with a chronic illness like kidney failure, you're very isolated from other people with, in a similar situation. And this leads to um, fear, anxiety, uh, lack of self-esteem, lack of confidence, a withdrawal from society because your existing friends who don't have any medical condition find it difficult to relate to you and your problem. At the moment, I think we do healthcare targeted mainly at the elderly and we need to think more carefully about how we should uh, deliver health care to teenagers and young adults who don't respond to the same approaches. This is Saran Lee, reporting for Brooks TV News. The County Council released some new plans today for the future of the Oxford transport system. To gather some more detail on the story, Ben Davies reports. Ask an average person about what they see when they think of Oxford and they will probably mention beautiful architecture and amazing views. All of this is true, however talk to a local resident of Oxford and they will probably mention this, traffic, congestion and busy streets. So what if I told you that the transport system in Oxford would soon go from this to this? A monorail is just one of the features suggested in the new Connecting Oxfordshire plans put forward by council leader Ian Hudspeth. I went down to council HQ to ask how the plans have been met. It's been very positive and people understand that it's not necessarily a final uh, process but we're actually having a debate about where we should be looking for improvements to Oxfordshire's transport system post 2020 and the idea of St Giles is to create sort of a boulevard, sort of something that could be a showpiece for Oxford whereas at the moment St Giles is dominated by vehicles and perhaps doesn't do justice to uh, the great city of Oxford. St Giles is one of many places being discussed, but let's take a closer look. Well, firstly there's the pedestrianisation of St Giles. 
which, as anyone who lives in Oxford knows, gets heavily congested, particularly during rush hour. With the pedestrianisation complete, it will free up all this space for the aforementioned monorail linking parts of the city. Finally, Mr Husbeth has included creating a rail link between the city centre and Cowley, with platforms at important business venues such as the BMW factory. So why exactly is this all being done? Well, by 2031, Oxford will have around 85,000 new jobs and 106,000 new homes. The county already contributes around £16 billion pounds a year to the national economy and has an ecosystem comparable with MIT and Silicon Valley in the USA. This means that Oxford is becoming a desirable place for both businesses and developers, and it also means that something should be done about the obvious growth in investment and population. Most reactions to the proposals have been positive, however Councillor for the Green Party, Ms Shashila Dow, has an alternative plan. We've been arguing that Hyde Bridge Street should be closed off to through traffic if you're going to tackle Oxford's transport problems so that people driving through Oxford would be forced down the ring road and those driving into Oxford could either come in but via the west or the north and that way you would reduce traffic on St Giles. You wouldn't close it off. You'd bring the, what is essentially two lanes of traffic together and pedestrianise half of it. So, do the people of Oxford feel the new plans will work? I think it could, depending on where they put it. What I uh, didn't like the road was it in St Giles. Uh, I think it would taint the, the atmosphere um, in the city. I think it would be a big mistake because I think there's so much character and ambience and beauty to this city. It's existed this way for a long time and people can get around quite well without it. Pedestrianisation is a great idea, mate, isn't it? It's perfect. But how do they fund it? The stats show the future is bright for the city, however with the economy still being tight, the council might have to close the door on the proposals for the time being. Ben Davis for Brooks TV News. That's it for this half, but still to come. Kyle Riggs takes a walk on the wild side. And we take a look at a sport that is becoming increasingly popular after the break. Welcome back. Joining us in the studio today is Oxford City Councillor for Labour in the Barton and Sandhills Ward, Van Coulter, who will be supporter of the proposed transport plans in Oxfordshire. Welcome, Councillor. Thank you. How are you today? Very well, thanks. So as we saw before the break, there are a lot of ideas being proposed for changing the transport in Oxford. And what are your opinions of the proposed views or proposed changes? We've got to get the right infrastructure to support the huge growth in the economy of Oxford and Oxfordshire. Looking forward about 20 years, we're going to have tens of thousands of more jobs, perhaps 100,000 new homes for people to get from home to work through what is basically a medieval city, it's going to be quite challenging. So we've got to be very innovative and I welcome all these proposals at this stage. I don't think anything should be ruled out and we need, we need fact-based evidence to make the best decision possible. So you think the improvements will help all of the people who live in Oxford, including the students, and just help them get to where they need to be and maybe improve their lifestyle? You think all the changes will help? Very much so, but it's also going to help Oxford's economy from the point of view of moving tourists about uh, more efficiently. If you think of it, we've got 9.5 million tourists who come to Oxford. Currently, they only come for a short period. On average, 18 hours is the length of time that a tourist will stay. For our economy to grow within that sector, we've got to persuade them to stay longer. We've got to make sure that there are more spaces for tourists to explore. And that's one of the reasons why I welcome, for example, pedestrianisation of St Giles. Take more people away from the corn market where it is heavily congested, provide people with a very welcoming space within St Giles. And if you look at um, other cities where they have carried out such innovative pedestrianisation, within a short period of time of four years, for example, the Trinity Bar in Dublin moved from having 60 businesses to 430. So it does show a massive improvement then. And a huge growth in the service economy. Lots more jobs, lots more of the tourist pound being spent in Oxford. And for the residents of Oxford, 
a much happier place with a better ambience for us all to live in. You brought up uh, pedestrianising St Giles. Yes. Um, what are your views on the plans to close the Hythe Bridge Street uh, and then not pedestrianising uh, St Giles? What do you think of those proposals? I would look at whatever the highways uh, officers recommend from the point of view, would that leave Park End Street too congested? Um, we have a city which I quite admit isn't built for the motor car. Um, from my point of view, I would prefer to see people being given opportunities to come here by light, light rapid transit rather than coming in in a car. But I do look forward to the time whenever sulphur lithium technology will make it possible for people to have electric vehicles that can travel 300 miles per charge. That way we can welcome cars back into the city because they won't be as polluting. We have areas of the city that exceed the European standard from the point of view of NO2 um, emissions. We've got to make sure we tackle the pollution problem as well as looking at where our traffic flows around the city. So it's, it's not just about getting people around, it's also about trying to aid the environment and trying to pollute less and create a greener footprint for Oxford. Very much so. Uh, that's one of the reasons why our bus companies have moved to a different fleet, which are 30% less polluting. Oxford has got a problem. Brilliant. It is too pollutant at the moment. Brilliant. Well, we've got to cut it off there, but thank you very much for joining us in the studio today. Thank you. Now, as the artists were proud to showcase their artwork at Meadowbrook Vision Arts uh, at the centre last week, Brooks TV reporter Jing Zhang went to have a uh, look at the exhibit. Programs. Second year artist teachers are curating an exhibition of their artwork at the Meadowbrook Visions Art Centre. The Artist Teacher Scheme is a Brooks accredited programme, so it's part of the MA in Education. The event is, is for the artist teachers who are actually practising uh, through the MA in Education. Artist teachers are in their second year of their MA programme. As part of their first year programme, um, they did a double module that was all about their own practice and it's about re-engaging. They all work within art education in schools or FE colleges. And the idea is that they produce a body of work. Some of them might have been making work up to this point. Some of them might not have made work for about 15 years. They all come from slightly different places. So the idea is that the module helps them to re-engage with their own art practice. Most art teachers continue to create art while sharing their expertise with students. That I'm working on at the moment are very much about um, sort of fragments of, of different memories and different experiences because I am drawn to kind of landscapes thinking about their identity as an artist and I think that that's a huge thing as an art teacher you're often sort of giving out and it's really difficult to then think about what kind of artwork you actually want to do without considering you know um, teaching and thinking about all the specification and things you usually have to think about and certainly helped the way I teach I think I was getting quite isolated because since I teach key stage two I'm the only art teacher so I'm everybody's sort of got their own little discipline and being just the art teacher so we've all kind of come in with these different ideas and different strategies and using those strategies in, in our own work has just really enhanced what we do. Being a working artist keeps teachers engaged in the creative process and gives them the experience and knowledge necessary to pass on to their students. This is Jin Zhang reporting for Brooks TV. Following his report on the future of physical media in Oxford, Kyle Riggs is back with another hard-hitting, no-nonsense investigation. Get ready for Rhino Week. For more than 40 years, the Cotswold Wildlife Park in Burford has been entertaining visitors across all ages with a large collection of animals coming in all shapes and sizes. But starting April 5th and running for an entire week, the spotlight was very much focused on one particular resident the rhinoceros. We spoke with keeper Mark Godwin to learn more about what Rhino Week had in store for guests. We have had rhinos at the park since uh, 1969. Um, they've been in, that was when the last large group of animals were brought over from Africa. At the moment we're doing Rhino Week, and which was, this is the 
second year of, of a more organised effort and we just do uh, simple competitions and stuff for the kids to get involved with using labels and signs around the park plus um, colouring in competitions and guest, this year we're doing guess the weight of the poo uh, which we've got a large tub of poo which people have to lift up and try and work out how much it is. And last year we made a replica of one of our old rhinos. Uh, when it died we removed the horn so we didn't want it to just disappear or get stolen or lost. And so we made a fibreglass resin copy of it and people have to try and lift it up and guess the weight of that which is quite hard because of the shape. Um, we have very unusual me methods and techniques from people trying to work out that weight by either picking their children up and shaking them because they know roughly how big they are and then comparing it to it and all sorts. Next year we're planning to get some good good form poo bolus and then we're going to varnish it and let people play with that as well. So we're trying to expand a little bit on the uh, poo front as well as on the rhino front. Of course, rhino poaching is still a threatening reality, with over 1,000 poaching cases reported in South Africa last year. Southern white rhinos, such as nine-month-old Astrid, were near extinct a century ago, but continued conservation efforts have since helped increase their numbers in the wild, and it's hoped that Rhino Week will have raised further awareness and support for these and other more endangered species of rhino before it's too late. The, the park supports Tush Trust and I've done for quite a while. We've done several things to uh, uh, promote it. The rhinos get this real grumpy, like preconceived idea that they're grumpy and aggressive, but they're really quite nice, friendly animals. Um, and we're just trying to raise awareness that it's a huge waste of a very great friendly animal just for a basically fingernail. So it just seems totally pointless just to kill an animal for that. And, and also if we just raise a little bit of awareness for it, we may make people a bit more aware of what's going on and how wasteful it all is. This is Kyle Riggs reporting for Brooks TV News. If you'd like to know more about the conservation efforts supported by the Cotswold Wildlife Park, visit www.tusk.org. And finally, our reporter Amanda Miller went down to Radley College on Good Friday to find out more about one of the fastest growing participation sports in the UK. It was a gorgeous sunny Good Friday outside Abingdon where the Good Friday trial took place on the 18th of April. The triathlon began early in the morning with over 400 people coming to participate. A standard triathlon consists of a 1500 meter swim, then a 40 kilometer cycle, followed by a 10 kilometer run. This triathlon also included a novice class, which allowed newcomers to triathlon to participate more easily. In fact, one of the most surprising things I found was the number of participants who were entirely new to triathlon. Well, I came into it with um, no training. I was here to support my girlfriend for moral support, and I completed it. So that's all I care about. This is my first. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm registered this year in another four, and the last one being the London triathlon. I picked up try this time last year and then did one in the summer. We spoke with Managing Director at Try Try, Chris Reese, about the number of new participants they had had that day. Um, we've had around about 65% of the people here today has been their first time for a triathlon as well. It's very much an idea that the fact it's full of um, lycra clad sort of supermen that are going around to go and take part in these Ironman distance events. But actually you can take part in triathlon from a very small distance as well and still get the medals, still get the feeling of having a mass participation event as well, which is good. And it varies your training. So we're normally if you join a run club, you're just doing running week in, week out. Join a triathlon club, you can go for a swim, go for a cycle, go for a run. Just mix up your training and keep yourself nice and fit and meet lots of new people doing it as well, which is good. Obesity is becoming an increasing problem in the UK, with an estimated 26% of adults in the UK class is obese, and this figure is expected to rise to almost 50% by 2030. Obesity is not only a serious health risk, it is also a huge drain on the NHS, as medical costs for the obese are around 30% higher than for those at a healthy weight, and it is important to encourage people to get involved in athletic events. Triathlon is currently the UK's fastest growing participation sport and the variety allows for people who might otherwise find doing just one long run or swim to stay motivated. As interest in this sport increases, the nation can work to fight against rising obesity. This is Amanda Miller reporting for Brooks TV News. That's it for this week. You can view our previous episodes at youtube.com slash Oxford Brooks. If you have a story you want to contact us about, email us at brooks.tv at brooks.ac.uk. That's it for tonight's show. Good night. Good night.